Well, introductions are probably less necessary since uh, I know those of you in the room, but good morning. I'm Janine Beck. I'm the Assistant Vice President for External Relations, and I just want to begin by acknowledging that many of you have reached out for interviews over the last several days, and I apologize that we have been unable to accommodate some of those requests in the moment because of the fact that the team has been working so diligently um, to ensure that we're well prepared and that we are prepared to protect the safety and health of our students, faculty, and staff. So thank you for your patience, and I appreciate you coming today. And also, I think most of you have already seen the new website, but if you haven't, coronavirus.uiowa.edu. We're updating that multiple times a day, and so it's a good resource if you have questions or if we haven't answered you quickly enough. Uh, oftentimes, we're posting all of the messages on that website so that you have access to those. So we've asked several of our campus leaders today to provide updates and then answer your questions. We have Rod Leonards, who is the UI Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations, Russ Gannam, Associate Provost and Dean of International Programs, Paul Natvig, who is the Interim Director of Student Health, Teresa Brennan, Chief Medical Officer for the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, and Michael Pentella, Director of the State Hygienic Lab at the University of Iowa. Each will give a few brief remarks and then we'll open it up to your questions. Thanks, Janine. Uh, Rod Leonard, Senior Vice President, Finance and Operations. I'll read through some points uh, that we have as an introduction and then pass it on to our team of experts here. Uh, the University of Iowa is closely monitoring reports and recommendations from the national and regional health departments regarding the 2019 novel coronavirus COVID-19. The university is taking safety precautions to detect and treat any potential cases of the virus by following the latest guidelines issued by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, and the Iowa Department of Public Health, IDPH. The university first began communicating to the campus on January 23rd. University leadership then began regularly meeting thereafter, and we continue to share updates, as Janine mentioned, on our landing page, coronavirus.uiowa.edu. We have been pushing those updates out to the campus on a weekly basis, every Thursday through our email service, and we also sent an all-campus um, update and notification yesterday. As the virus has continued to spread to other countries and with renewed concern about its spread within the United States, the university and its leadership have continued important work that began in January uh, to prepare for the possibility of COVID-19 in our community. The University of Iowa is taking proactive measures to protect our students, our faculty and our staff and our visitors and will follow the current University of Iowa critical incident management plan. It's important to note that throughout this process, the university will maintain its operations and its commitment to excellence in higher education. Our students are at the top of our list of priorities throughout this process. Though there are no confirmed cases in Iowa at this time, the university is fully prepared to diagnose and treat any potential patient who might be affected with this virus should the need arise. We are fortunate to have a premier medical center on our campus with some of the foremost experts in epidemiology, microbiology, and immunology. We will continue to use that expertise and our experts to help guide our decisions on a local basis, and we will continue to follow the, CD, the CDC and IDPH, both updates and direction, and we will also continue to communicate with our community. A couple of quick notes to make. One, the University of Iowa has a plan. The University of Iowa is following that plan and it is in coordination with, C with CDC and IDPH. Also, something to note, in events like this, with social media, there are risks of misinformation, of rumors. We again want to encourage anyone who has questions regarding the status or directions we are taking to follow uh, our or go to our website at coronavirus.uiowa.edu where we will keep updated information and the latest we have for our community. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over um, to the other speakers. Russ. Sure. Uh, thanks, Rod. So again, my name is Russ Gannam. I am Associate Provost and Dean of International Programs. Um, we have been focused on this issue almost exclusively since January. 
uh, once the coronavirus broke out. Uh, our first point of emphasis was on students return, international students, uh, most of them returning from, from China, but from other parts of, of, of the world. Many of these students had actually returned to the United States before the, the virus spiked in China. Um, nonetheless, our goal was to provide as much information uh, to not just international students, but to the campus community about health and safety precautions that, that they needed to take. Um, the process, or the, uh, 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 everything has unfolded you know, in, in ways that we couldn't have anticipated, but as the virus spread, uh, we have unfortunately needed to cancel programs um, in not only China, but also South Korea, Italy, and we've now uh, canceled exchange programs in Japan. We've, in most cases, been following uh, guidelines from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, the Iowa Department of Public Health, and also the State Department. We've shut down programs where the CDC uh, threat level rating was a three, um, or the, and or the Department of State level rating was either a three or a four. Uh, the four is the highest level of hazard that the State Department um, uh, confers upon a particular region, um, and it basically means that Americans are not supposed to go to the, these places. So now countries with a four include uh, China, South Korea, uh, North Korea, Iran, um, and parts of Italy are now a four, even though most of the country is, is at a three. So in order to ensure the health and safety of our students, uh, which as Rod says, is our first priority, we have had to cancel uh, some programs. Uh, we continue to monitor the, the situation because at this point, um, many of the countries where we still have students are now at a CDC or Department of State level of only one or two in terms of, of threat. So um, most of our students now are in, are, are in countries where conditions are stable. We have been communicating to students uh, where, we, where we had to cancel the programs about what their options uh, were um, in terms of returning back to the United States, in terms of academic credit. In many instances, we are working through providers abroad who understand the reasons why we've needed to cancel um, uh, programs and they will be working with students uh, in most instances to complete their coursework online. And I do have some prepared language uh, along, uh, along the, those lines which I'd like to read to you and then I can um, elaborate a little bit more. So in terms of the question, what becomes of a student's academics? Uh, for study abroad programs where the academic delivery is controlled by the University of Iowa, the university and the office of the provost will work to ensure that students can complete their coursework and earn full academic credit for the spring 2020 semester. Some classes were suspended temporarily as individuals, uh, as individual instructors determine how best to complete the semester's instruction. Detailed plans for the continuation of classes will be shared with those impacted as they are developed. So the idea to, uh, to underscore is that this is still a fluid situation. Um, in terms of, and even in terms of uh, student, uh, students returning to the United States. Not all of them are making their travel plans, uh, uh, or some of them are still in the process of making their, their travel plans. We've urged them to come home as, as, as soon as possible. We are tracking uh, those students who have returned and are updating our lists daily. Um, and once those students come back to the United States, if they are, um, and Dr. Notvig can um, speak to this more uh, in more detail than I can, but if they are coming back from places like Italy or South Korea, then um, CDC and Iowa Department of Public Health guidelines are uh, strongly urging self-isolation. Um, in many instances, these students are not either, either not from Iowa or not from Iowa City. But self-isolation is part of the information that we are communicating and that any questions, at least on a medical level, need to be directed to, to student health. So we are in constant communication with students and with their, their emergency contacts. Uh, we do invite queries of, of, of any kind. Uh, no question is, is, is too small uh, when it comes to this, this matter. And now I'll ask uh, Paul maybe to shed light on um, 
uh, on how things are shaping up from a medical slash public health perspective. Sure. Yeah, again, I'm Paul Natvig, the Interim Director at uh, Student Health, and I've been a psychiatrist there for almost 25 years. Um, so clearly our concern is the safety of the students and therefore the campus and the community. Um, most of us who work here have children who've been to college or are in college, and, and we, we understand the, the awesome responsibility to make sure parents feel their kids are taken care of, and, and I think they are. I mean, uh, it's very helpful that we're in Iowa. People get along. I meet people like Russ. We've, we've, I've gotten to know him quite well, and I just want to reassure people that behind the scenes, there's a lot of work going on, a lot of preparation. There's not a single case yet in Iowa that we know of, but we're ready. And we're regularly in meetings with the hospital. Um, uh, we're regularly in meetings with the administrative side. With, uh, we're in communication with Iowa Department of Public Health, Johnson County Public Health. So, so we are ready. Um, I, I think the th thing that keeps coming to my mind is what's going to be really important for everyone is, is be educated. Fear's not going to help you. Panic's not going to help you. Being educated might. Uh, understanding. And, and it's hard when the, the guidelines are changing every day. I will be honest. We, we're trying to keep up with them. But that's the nature of uh, when you have a new illness like this. Um, it's often compared to influenza, and that, that seems fair. Uh, but, but I think the thing that you have to compare COVID-19 to is COVID-19 and learning what that's going to be about. But, but I, people should be reassured there are a lot of tools in place. They've been in place for a long time for how to handle these things. There are experts in this, and they are, they are now working very hard. So currently, there's, there's low risk in Iowa. Um, we, we're well aware that travel is a risk, and we're, uh, we track that closely. And so the, the message would be if, if you are, are known risk and you would have been given that information if you're returning from a country, the most important thing is to monitor yourself for any, any symptoms like fever, symptoms like a cough, something uh, you're short of breath. But these are symptoms that are very similar to influenza, very similar to just a common cold. Um, as you, many of you know, the illness itself in most people, especially young people, is, is fairly mild. It'll feel just like a normal cold or influenza, um, uh, but in, in certain number of people, 15, 20 percent, it becomes much more severe. And those, uh, when you develop symptoms and you're at risk, you definitely need to get a hold of, uh, go to hold of your health care provider. If you're a student, get a hold of us. Um, students who've traveled who don't have any symptoms, um, the, the current guideline is is that they, they self-isolate, and there are guidelines we are providing as to how to do that, and those are in evolution, and, and I think it's a balance of you're asymptomatic, your risk is still very low, um, but you want to be separated from people. I think in education, I think we all need to start thinking about, you know, how does this, how do you get this thing? Well, currently the information is that you probably get it from being around somebody who has it, and you've been within six feet of them for quite a while. So. You know, things like that. People need to start thinking about what's my six-foot bubble. And things are going to change. Um, we don't know what will happen in Iowa, but it's going to spread in the country. We just don't know to what degree. And as these things happen, it will be very important that people be ready to understand and ready to, to react because there may be things that pivot and shift where we're, we're providing health care in ways we didn't before. Because um, we do know the illness, it seems, for most people, it's, it's relatively mild. And that doesn't mean, for example, it might mean in the future, that doesn't mean once we know it's prevalent in the community, it might mean that you don't necessarily need to come in and it's, it may be best you're not. I'm not saying that will happen. But these are kinds of things people need to be prepared for and think about as things change. So, so again, we just want to reassure if, if the information we send out, people have questions, concerns, parents, students, please, they're encouraged to contact our nurse line or email us. We are more than happy to answer the questions. Uh, and I can speak to things specifically after. Good morning. Uh, I'm Terry Brennan, Teresa Brennan. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at the hospital at UI Hospitals and Clinics. Um, and I want to thank you for being here today. I think that this information is powerful to the community to, to know um, what's going on and how well we're prepared. So I appreciate you coming. Um, right now, as many have said, we are not aware of any confirmed cases in Iowa. And although that gives us great comfort, um, we at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics feel that being prepared is the most important thing. We um, have robust plans in place to deal, if, deal with um, how we take care of patients, how we protect our staff and other patients if we should have a patient who has COVID-19. We have a long-standing foundation of having a bioemergency response team that comes together whenever there's an infectious disease concern or any other bioemergency. 
That team has been meeting since uh, January um, when uh, coronavirus first was uh, identified in Wuhan. Um, the team is made up by multiple people from multiple different um, areas in the hospital, so they're very talented people and they um, know what they're doing. They're very good at what they're doing. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to say that they, um, I feel like they have uh, allowed us to be completely prepared. Um, I can confirm that we are prepared. Um, the disease is changing rapidly, uh, and so that is a challenge for all of us, um, as has been said. Uh, but we daily have a situational report of what's going on in the nation, in Iowa, um, in the world, um, and at UIHC, which fortunately, nothing yet. Um, and we, um, we meet on a regular basis, and we're looking forward um, three or four steps down the road to make sure that we're covering everything that could come. Um, so I'm really pleased that that foundation exists and that um, we have such an excellent team. We work closely um, with the State Hygienic Lab, with the Iowa Department of Public Health, with the Johnson County Public Health Department, um, as well as the CDC. And so we, we have good, um, just-in-time ready information that um, allows us to be very well prepared and, and we're very appreciative of our partners. Um, and as always, I, I'll just um, finish with saying that we're, we're obviously committed to taking care of patients when they need us, and um, we have a great team, and, and we're prepared to do this. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Pintella. I'm the director of the State Hygienic Laboratory, as, which is part of the University of Iowa. We are Iowa's state public health laboratory. As such, uh, we serve the all 99 counties in Iowa. We, as of last Thursday, are prepared to offer this test on any patient that has been identified by the Iowa Department of Public Health and their clinician as needing this test to be performed. Uh, this virus has to be detected by a special molecular test that was provided to us by the CDC. We verified its performance in our hands and are using that assay. We uh, are committed to uh, doing the test whenever it's needed. It takes uh, about five hours to perform the test. And it's a technical, technically demanding test. So we are uh, trained and we have uh, committed staff who are very competent to do this. So we uh, prepare for emergencies as our colleagues do. And part of our preparation is that we connect with every clinical lab in the state so that anywhere, uh, any patient uh, could receive a specimen and it be shipped to us from anywhere in the state. Uh, we are um, uh, connected electronically to report results to the CDC and to the Iowa Department of Public Health. We are in constant communication with our colleagues and uh, we alert clinical labs of what they need to be ready to do as well. Thank you, we wanna take your questions. I will say if we don't have answers today, we will continue to make ourselves available and try to share information as it becomes available. But we'll open it up to your questions. Roger. What? Thank you. Uh, Rod Leonards, Senior Vice President of Finance and Operations. Among the, the uh, remarks uh, I made, they included the keynotes that we uh, have a plan, we are following it. That plan is in conjunction with and in coordination with the uh, CDC um, and with the Iowa um, Department of Public Health. Um, we know that there are social media um, bits of information out there that can create rumor and misinformation. We are encouraging the public and our university community to plug into our website, uh, coronavirus.uiowa.edu, for the latest from our perspective and from the experts we have on campus. We are reassured by having a, uh, a top-notch medical center at the University of Iowa that is staying on top of this. But it is an evolving matter, but one we continue to monitor and coordinate with our state and 
and federal officials on the health front. So uh, it is, is a plan and our critical incident management plan is in place and since January we have been communicating with and working with our university community with the students and obviously their families first on our mind and first on our priority list. I direct you to the Iowa Department of Public Health webpage on coronavirus. They are keeping a track of the number of tests performed. Uh, no, I, I, uh, I understood the problems that were encountered. The CDC released the EUA test in conjunction with the FDA. We performed our uh, verification process, and part of that test did not perform as expected. Consequently, we uh, had limited data here from our performance of the test, but CDC added our data and a lot of other states and other local public health labs data together so they could determine what was going on. They advised us last Wednesday that one of the test parameters could be eliminated so that the rest of the test would perform as expected. So I was pleased that they reached that conclusion and allowed us to start our testing. Well, you never know how many testing resources you will need, so that's a difficult thing to state. I will state that uh, uh, we have uh, about 250 tests on hand right now, and we are expecting another shipment of a test kit today. So that's a, re a regularly changing activity. So I'm not concerned about the need at this time. Uh, I think we have the resources that we need. Uh, can you define monitored? Oh, uh, it flagged if anything could be, does it sort of self-isolation or anything like that? Um, I don't have that information and, and we might be nervous about giving that just because of the privacy of the individuals. I can tell you um, it's a relatively small number, um, but we are following um, the recommendations from the CDC and most recently released from the Iowa Department of Public Health that um, anyone who came back from China is in quarantine and obviously they're not working and they're being monitored through our employee health and the Iowa Department of Public Health. And then those who have returned uh, within that 14 day period from um, Italy, Japan, Iran, um, and South Korea. Are doing self monitoring That's correct. Yeah. And self containment at home. Uh, well, I would say that the FDA has been working on that and what they, uh, the changes they made this past weekend will bring more laboratories able to b do this testing in the future. So I don't think it's a problem in Iowa at the current time. And I would say to the comment of who's being tested and who isn't, it, it is challenging because we're in influenza season and the symptoms are very similar. Um, we take our guidance from the CDC and the Iowa Department of Public Health, and they are the experts in, in uh, these outbreaks and in um, infectious disease. And so um, they, they guide us, and, and we follow their guidance. Well, um, with respect to Japan, we're talking about a total number of five students. Okay. So three of them have not left yet. Um, it's important to keep in mind that the academic calendar in Japan is much different from that in the United States. So those students um, uh, have not departed, and so we're working with um, the uh, Asian and Slavic Department in the Division of World Languages, Literatures, and Cultures, the Japanese program in particular, to find solutions uh, for, for those students. Similarly, we have one student, um, a Japanese major, who was scheduled to go to Japan on an exchange, but he is a Chinese national and he's in Beijing now. 
Um, so his situation is, is, is exceptional, but we are asking him to work with our Japanese program to find solutions. And then we've got one student who's actually in Japan now uh, on a year-long program, uh, and he is on break, and unfortunately we're, we're asking him to, to, come, to come home, and so we'll need to figure out sort of what his academic program will look like moving forward. Um, uh, if, if we count the, the Chimba program in Italy, that's 80, and then that's in, that's in Italy. Um, and then another, we have another 29 in uh, uh, provider programs in Italy, so that would be, what, around 110. Uh, then we have uh, a handful of students who are in South Korea, uh, I think four total, and then the five in, in Japan. So. Of the students that we have brought back, I mean that that total would be around oh, quick math 120, 125. Yeah, and about bringing them back, I was just confused. Are they being brought back to campus specifically, or to their like respective homes if they're not from Iowa City? Most of the students are not from Iowa City, yeah. so they're going back to their their respective homes. Um, the uh, with the Chimba program is organized and sponsored by the University of Iowa, but the students come from all over the country. Um, so many of those students are you know, returning to far-flung des destinations. Um, even within the, um, uh, the program provider uh, uh, programs that we have in, in Italy um, through University Studies Abroad uh, Consortium, through IES, uh, through Wells College, um, many of those students live either in Des Moines or are from out of state or Cedar Rapids. So while we don't have exact numbers on how many would be coming back to Iowa City, preliminary in, uh, indications are that uh, we don't have that many. Yeah, like, like a handful or a very I mean, at this point, we don't know exactly. We'd have to look and, and find that information. But, you know, the indications are that we're not dealing with overwhelming numbers. <clears throat> Yes, <clears throat> and in some cases, you know, we, we were able to present those options and find those options for, for students, especially on a provider program. We're able to do that more easily because the providers have programs all over the world. So if, if for example, a student was scheduled to be in Seoul for, for the spring semester, um, we could conceivably work through the provider to send them to Australia or to Britain or to, to France, depending on what their disciplinary interests are. So some students were able to find alternate programs. Yeah, and sorry, just one more. Sure. Um, I know that this, uh, that trying to send samples for the summer, um, are these cancellations just for the spring that we're talking about? Just, just for the spring, we have, right. Korea. Right, we have, um, it, it, for the moment it's, it's just spring. We haven't made a determination on summer yet. Isolate? Um, I, I would have to defer to our medical personnel. Well, I think as Russ was saying, most of these uh, students who were on these study abroad programs were not living in the dorms, so they wouldn't be returning. Mm -hmm. but that's something we're working on, so it's a different situation when they're not coming back to campus. And, and, and again, it's an evolving situation. Uh, not every state is following the same guidelines because every, everybody's trying to learn about this. Um, uh, the advice, you know, so these guidelines are coming from Iowa Department of Public Health. And so if a situation arose where a student had no place to go, we would make arrangements and that would be safe. And again, keep in mind, this is a, would be somebody without symptoms who's traveled in the area. And I think, again, it's important to remember that what we've seen so far, most of the testing is negative, people come from areas. And so again, important to sort of conceptualize what happens. You know, you're living, you could live in a town where the building next over has a lot of people infected, but you never got near there. Your, your risk is zero. And so that's what we saw. Most of the travelers that have been tested who come back are, neg are negative even when they have symptoms. They have something else. So, so the risk, certainly of somebody who has no symptoms, is very low. But that's part of what we're trying to convey is that this is, uh, I think people worry and get concerned. Um, but, but the answer to the question is we would make arrangements um, if, if that 
came to it to have them uh, be able to self-isolate. Right, and, and as a follow-up to that, um, it's, I think, from what we were hearing, and this, these are anecdotal reports, but that students are having no trouble transiting through Europe um, and the United States to, to come home, that there's, um, that uh, the traffic through the airports is, is free-flowing, there hasn't been a lot of testing or restrictions, um, and so pretty much the travel is as normal as you could expect it to be under the circumstances. Um, so we, because of our bioemergency response team foundation, we have stored supplies. So we have extra um, uh, ventilators, breathing machines. Um, we are also uh, daily keeping track of our personal protective equipment, things like masks and gloves um, to protect our, our patients um, from other patients who may have it or from our, for our, our faculty and staff. Um, so we feel like we're in a good position at this point, but again, things are changing. Um, and you know, some companies that make some of these disposals are in China. Um, other, others aren't, but everybody is trying to stock up, and so the, the companies are actually doing a good job of allocating. So at this point, we're, we're doing fine. Roger, you had one more. Yeah, uh, Teresa, I don't know if it was when you were, what happens if you have an identified positive case here somewhere in Yeah, great question. So um, when there's an identified case in Iowa, the State Hygienic Lab would have um, had a positive test. It then gets sent to the CDC for confirmation. The Iowa Department of Health actually then orchestrates um, the patient's journey. So if a patient is well and doesn't need hospitalization, the best place for them is to remain in their home. If the patient requires hospitalization, they should be in a place that can take care of them. Um, and many, many hospitals in Iowa are capable of doing that. Um, as we know, some patients become critically ill um, and require a higher level of care, and, and certainly we're prepared to take care of those patients as well. Did you have any questions? I wanted to give you an opportunity if you had any questions before we... Um, is there not any people We'll check if, if, if their time allows, as there, I don't know, each individual schedule, but we can see about that. Um, Amy, one question. I know that you just arrived, but then I need to wrap up so that I can let them get to their next events, and we'll try to see if people have availability. Yeah, I just have the, the answer, but how many of these are still abroad, and uh, can you clarify again what resources are being offered to the students who are mm -hmm. <clears throat> At this point, um, we have uh, around 300 students abroad. Uh, we have another 91 who are scheduled to depart for foreign destinations over spring break, so within the next uh, 10 days or so. So that would raise the level to around four or 400. Uh, in terms of, of resources, we have sent communications to students who are still abroad and their emergency contacts about um, uh, uh, health resources that are available, counseling resources that are available, also uh, what options may exist should the programs be canceled because realistically we have to entertain that possibility, although we certainly are, uh, would, uh, would not favor that, that type of um, uh, option at this, at this point. But uh, those messages, if I'm not mistaken, have uh, been placed on the university's website, so they are in the public domain. All right, we're going to end the news conference at this time, but we'll try to see who has availability for any additional questions after. And as I said, thank you for coming today. I know that there have been uh, quests for interviews and that we've not uh, always been available because of the diligent work the team is doing. But as uh, more news becomes available, we'll reconvene this group for other Q&As in the future. Thank you for your time.